That's where we took Mandela, Mr. Mandela to the beach. That evening was dark. It was a little bit of light from the streets here. The water was more high tide. First, didn't believe we were on the beach. He hear the sound, but he wanted to feel the water really, you know. And he tasted it. Take this handful of water and just taste it to feel if it's really salt, if you're really at the beach. And we show him direction to Robben Island. We show him that is Robben Island. The first thing is a big ship because there was not much lights on on Robben Island. Just a few lights was on at that evening because only security lights at sensitive points was on. Otherwise, the island is dark. A toespraak wat zonder twijfel in die geschiedenis zal staan als een waterscheiding in die Zuid-Afrikaanse politieke ontwikkelingsproces. 1970s South Africa. Amidst the turmoil of the apartheid regime, an unlikely friendship was blossoming. The first time when we drove Mandela in a car, it was here in 1980-81. We put in a Ford Cortina. There was quite a lot of time to take him out. Said at least every second month. I think Mandela enjoyed it in a way, but he was not secure when he was sitting maybe alone for a few minutes at a space because he was become nervous. Where's his water must look after him? because he don't know what to expect, how the people are going to attack him, and he's afraid. The lives of Nelson Mandela, South Africa's most notorious political prisoner, and Christo Brandt, his guard, were intertwined for more than 10 years. It became a long-lasting friendship that broke all the rules of the apartheid regime. The men's backgrounds couldn't have been more different. Mandela, a lawyer with royal blood, and Brandt, a working-class farmer's son. I was 18 years old when I started work on Robben Island. I never heard about the name Nelson Mandela at all. 1978 was a harsh winter in Cape Town. The first time I'd be on a big on a boat, on a big boat out to Robben Island. Brandt had no idea what he was getting himself into. I always heard about the biggest big criminals on Robben Island, murderers. So I go out. I was also a little bit nervous when I get to Robben Island. Brandt was immediately put to work in the so-called B section, the wing reserved for the prison's most dangerous inmates. By this point, Mandela had been locked up for 15 years. Young Brandt went about his work with no idea of who the prisoners were. And the prisoners greet friendly and some of the prisoners still standing up, made their beds, standing for ready for inspection. And they all greet friendly and I see the old people this and come back to the sergeant and then they count the prisoners, they open up for taking out their toilet pots and clean up. And then later that day I asked the sergeant, what is this criminals in for? Because I see life, now Mandela life and all the only life. <coughs> he said, that's the people who try to overthrow the country. That's a, that's a terrorist of the country. And then immediately I feel the hate in towards myself for these guys. Because my friend died in the army in training 1977. We attended his funeral three months later after he was in training. Killed on the border. And so I, must, I hate these people immediately because they're the ones who killed my friends. Mandela was condemned to life imprisonment and exiled to the island in 1964. This was the last image the world got to see of him before his incarceration. When Christo Brandt began his work as a prison guard, the outside world didn't know what Mandela looked like anymore. His name was, was well, name was well known, but his face was not familiar to the people. In fact, the regime was so sure he wouldn't be recognized that it allowed Mandela and Brandt to visit a hospital in the heart of the city. From 1981, South Africa's public enemy number one walked regularly through the city of Cape Town. When we walk, he will ask us questions. He's all amazed of the new cars, which is on the road. Always look at the cars and things. And he said the people are busy. There's a heavy, busy street. He was afraid to walk over the street. We said, OK, it's clear now. We can walk, and we walk quick over the street. But he didn't want to walk without us on the street. He was afraid to just to approach the street. We must take him by the arm. I said, come, Mandela. <laughs> Back on the island, Mandela was subjected to a continued regime of humiliation and oppression. But he did not react with anger. In his autobiography, he wrote, The most important person in any prisoner's life is not the Minister of Justice, not the Commissioner of the Prisons, not even the head of the prison, but the warden in one section. In general, we treated the wardens as they treated us, yet being friendly with wardens was not an easy proposition, for they generally found the idea of being courteous to a black man abhorrent. And Mandela said one day himself, he said when he asked the officer, he put in writing, he wanted extra blanket, that time they sleep on the floor. The officer says, prisoners only allowed three blankets, extra blanket not been approved. And the whole legally thing about prisoners must have three blankets. Then he asked sometimes a normal warder, 
and she was friendly with, become friends with. I said, what is, hey, what is very cold tonight? He said, take some blanket. He said, no, sure, you get him one. Just put it out tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, he first put the blanket out. He said, sometimes you get more right with the normal warders on a lower rank than you get with the officers. Because they understand them. They understand they become them. close. Yes, we become very close. In the early 1980s, Mandela's health deteriorated. He developed problems with his lung and prostate. The regime in Pretoria began to worry that his death in prison might lead to a national uprising. Christo Brandt continued to accompany Mandela to the hospital. They often came to this hospital, just outside the Cape Town city centre. Look at that, three windows. Was the cells where we kept him. When they do hospitalization, if you go for operations, anything, we host him in that rooms. That's why the bars on. That was where the bars is on, yes. The surgeons were not deemed trustworthy. Brandt was therefore present in the operating room during Mandela's surgeries. The thing was, they're afraid uh, Mandela is not, they can, they can wake him up in theater. The doctors can ask him questions and things. He can talk in theater. They don't want him to, to, go, to talk anything to doctors or something. They can greet and that all put him out to the operation back because he don't want him to communicate with the doctors because the government didn't trust all the doctors who worked on him. Brandt was also under strict observation. His boss frequently turned up at the hospital. What happened also in this hospital, there was a guy, James Gregory. He was my superior on a time in Paulsville prison. And when Mandela go for operation, he must be reported to Pretoria. If Mandela's awake, he talked to us, he communicates, he's fine. And that day he want to go on weekend, he's in a hurry, and Mandela's operated, and Mandela don't want to come around, he's still sleeping. And then he said to him, Kafar, we're going to kill you, the whites is on you, and he's swearing him off. And Mandela, oh, oh, oh. and he try and think. And when he recovered later, Gregory was not there. Then he asked me later, he got a funny dream. I said, what dream, Mandela? He said, he heard his voices, people calling Kaffer, all that. I said, no, I didn't hear anything, because I can't tell if Gregory had done that. From 1984 onwards, the apartheid regime began to carefully reach out to ANC leaders. Speaking directly with terrorists was out of the question, but President Boto wanted to know what Mandela would do if granted parole. The Secret Service contacted Christo Brandt, his relationship with Mandela appeared useful. Brandt was asked to approach Mandela with a few specific questions. I walked in and I was bucked. I show him that I'm bucked. That was the sign? That's a sign. Before I even asked, the sign was in my things and I show him. And then I show him again because that he can, and then he click, he show me, he's fine, he understand. And I asked him certain questions. The same evening on television, they repeated that type of things which they asked in the response of Mandela. P.W. Buta gave his response on Mandela's response. Then I know, yeah, this question I asked Mandela, he answered me that, and P.W. Buta just talked the opposite what we asked him. If Mandela were to say he that he not, wanted constitutional he change... He does not want it. He stated it all over and over again. Buta was a hardliner. If he had his way, Mandela would stay behind bars. But the increasing violence across the country and economic sanctions from the international community forced the regime to negotiate with the ANC. Meanwhile, the story of Nelson Mandela entered the spotlight yet again. He could walk with his guards through Cape Town no more. People want to know more about Mandela. They want Mandela to release now. There was more oppression to Mandela's release. And then we become more security-wise. We take him in private cars, not in a government car, for a government ambulance of a, of a bucky a guard anymore, like a prisoner. He was in private clothes, also dressed, not in prison uniform anymore. We try to make him feel that he's part of the community and people not pass and recognize him. After almost 26 years in the Robben Island and Polesmore prisons, Christo Brandt escorted his prisoner to his next home, the Victor Verster prison. Nelson Mandela serves the last two years of his sentence in a villa formerly occupied by the prison director. It was also for him strange, you know? When he walked one day in the kitchen, when we walked him out there, and he said, why a TV in the kitchen? Then we said, no, no, it's a microwave. Now he didn't understand the microwave. We show him how the thing worked. That is warm up your food. He started learning new equipment. The 11th of February, 1990, the day of Mandela's release, went down in history. Crowds surrounded the prison gate to get the first glimpse of the new leader. Helicopters hovered above the villa, with millions waiting in suspense in front of their TVs. That's our prison gate. That's our last one going to start living. Hey, hey. I was there a day before that to go and greet him and see him off and tell him he must keep strong, we must keep in touch, and then he left. Christo Brandt was Mandela's guard for 12 years. In 1992, 
Mandela became his president. After his release, the two men lost contact. But in 1995, the former prisoner called his guard to offer him a job in the presidential office. Tonight I want to welcome somebody here who's become like a father to me during that years. His name is Nelson Holish Lashla Mandela. The two friends worked happily together for years. <laughs> 